it's important for writers to understand that they are not their stories. Like, this is not me. Do you always know where the story is going when you begin a short story? No, not at all. Um, some I really don't know. Some I have a stronger sense. And then in some cases, I begin stories at the end, which I think a lot of people do. Um, you know, there's something interesting about that way of, you know, I mean, stories have to be, stories have to have a beginning, middle, and end, but not necessarily in that order. So starting with the ending has certain structural opportunities that are attractive. Um, but, you know, in some cases, you know, I may have heard a story, and so there was something about that story that drew me to it that I may sort of borrow something of the arc of that story, or I may take, you know, elements of that story or like the first stage of that story. I think I'm, ne I'm never trying to sort of replicate something that happened in the world onto the page, but certainly, you know, things that exist in the world do find their way onto the page. Um, where a story ends up, I think is is really important. I mean, endings like beginnings, like openings are are really important. But I, as has been pointed out, I I, I like open ended endings. I, I like giving the characters the open destiny of life. I like giving them a chance to reveal who they really are. I mean, in the case of that story about the jazz pianist. I had been thinking about him for a very long time, and yet I had never given him the voice to tell his own story. And I think, I think in general, I work in first person, and it's mostly because I like to give characters their own voice and let their stories go in the direction that they go in, sort of unmanipulated by me. Um, which involves, you know, to an extent following your instincts or your impulses. And then in some cases you make decisions. Well, you know, this character has only loved one person. Uh, do I show him with her? Do I have it just in his imagination? Do I dramatize it? I mean, there are always lots of choices and just try to follow the ones that are like true to the character. I don't know. If, does that answer the question? It does. I'm wondering, should a writer know what their short story is not? Yes. But that, that doesn't happen until, until you're already into the story. I think when you're starting the story, your sense of what it's about is probably going to change. Um, my friend Andrew Porter, who has a new collection of stories out, The Disappeared, um, is very good at this, extremely good at this. Like He sets up these arenas where the dramatic action takes place and things that belong in that arena that are in some way contributing to the story that's being told in that arena are allowed to make their way in into the action. And if if they don't fit or if it seems like it's just too much, like, you know, stories can't be about everything. Not only that, they can't be about too many things. They have to ultimately make some choices about what they're about. And then hopefully the specificity of those choices will lead to universality. But, you know, there's no guarantee that that will happen. Do you believe that great stories never leave the body? Once wow. they've entered it? That's a great question. Um, Lawns, which I read you the opening paragraph from, has never left my body. I, I, I went to a reading when I was 19 years old. I had no idea who Mona Simpson was. I had no idea what that story was. I, I really was just learning about literature in many ways for the first time. I, I mean, I knew some things, but I didn't know very much. And she gave this reading and she read that story out loud. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. 
my, my face was covered in tears at the end of that reading. It was like I, I didn't even know I even had those feelings that were summoned up by that story. And I, I had such a visceral reaction and such a... Um, it, it, was, it was character, it was place, it was subject matter, it was, you know, how do you love someone who treats you a certain way? Like, human beings are amazing. We have so much love in us that we, we, we even, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, it's a very complicated story, but it doesn't use caricatures. It doesn't use two-dimensional characters. It deals with ver very difficult material and three-dimensional characters, people who really hurt each other, really love each other, and it's the same. How do you know you have a complete story? Yeah, that's a very hard one. Um, I think really the only answer to that is to look at an actual story um, because stories that apprentice writers write are often not complete, but they don't understand. And it might be because it needs more scenes. It might be because it needs fewer scenes. It might be that there's an extraneous character that has to be written out of the story. It may be that there's a character that needs to be added to the story. I mean, there's so many ways to answer that. And it's a very important question. I mean, and I think ultimately, if you write enough stories and you study, you know, masters like Flannery O'Connor and you read what she has to say about writing stories and Carver and, and so on, you'll eventually learn how to complete your own stories. But even so, you're going to want to show them to other people and make sure that they feel complete to other people too. When I say other people, I mean other people who understand what a complete story is. Now, the story that you told me about uh, that's one of her famous ones where she seduces a man in a barn who supposedly has this heart condition, right. was that based on anything that had happened to her? I don't know. And um, I mean, I, I don't really delve into that area, you know, when I, um, when I teach, um, it's a ground rule of my classes that we don't speculate at all on the writer's real life connection to the potential material. Um, so for example, let's say that one of my students puts up a story about a character who's lived on the streets for five years it is not acceptable to ask whether the writer has lived on the streets for five years because what we're trying to do in a fiction writing workshop is like understand stories, understand what makes them work, like what could make them work better, um, what could make them complete. Um, and so what I ask the students to do is say, okay, Here's the story, here's the reader, and here's the writer. Reader, you try to address the story, and writer, you're going to listen on behalf of the story. So the, so the reader and the writer are not actually having a direct conversation in my classes because it's important for writers to understand that they are not their stories. Like, this is not me. I may have written this. This is a work of art that I created. And I need to learn how to make this the best work of art I can, independent of whatever my personal experience has been. And the reader is tasked with helping me to, to you know, give her honest, sensitive response to the work so that the writer can say, okay, you know, six people in the class didn't understand something, so maybe it wasn't that clear. This is also a way of depersonalizing the workshop experience. Um, 
I've been in workshops where things got nasty because, um, you know, personal things were brought into the conversation. I really think that like when you're talking about fiction writing, you should talk about fiction writing. Otherwise, I don't know. There's all sorts of dangers that can come of that. That's a great rule. Because so I think you can be so much freer if you don't feel that there's going to be judgment. And there's going to be judgment. It doesn't matter if it's squeaky clean or something so salacious that it wouldn't be safe for work. I think people are fear that their, their families, their culture, their, their peers will judge them. They'll judge themselves. It's true. I mean, it's very delicate, um, that balance in class. I mean, I, I really think, I, you know, I've seen like people brought to tears in workshops. Like it's, it, it has the potential to really hurt people because people often, you know, put something of their soul into their writing. I, I understand that. Like I, it's because I understand that that I structure my classes the way that I do, like I really, I don't want the, the writer to ever feel that the reader is personally criticizing him or her, because to me, that's when a, 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 a workshop can start to break down. And also, it's, it is really important for a writer to learn that he or she is separate from the text that he or she has produced, because how is the writer ever going to be able to revise anything if like she thinks that everything she wrote is like chiseled in marble? You, you have to look at your work as something that's in development, that's at a certain draft stage. You know, some stories can be written in a few drafts. Some may need 20 or 30 drafts. It's the writer's job to figure out what the text needs, not what the writer needs, not what the writer personally needs, but what the text needs. And that's exactly what I want the reader to be addressing. And when it works well, the workshop can be a magical place. I mean, I've seen st oh, I'm, that one woman's story. It was in American short fiction. I don't know how many thousands of... Uh, Submissions they get a year, but it's a lot. It's very hard to get in there. So, I mean, it's yeah. When it works, it's it's it can be really cool. I love that. So no no crosstalk or no uh, you, you're not uh, no one asks questions about is this you? Never. Right. I like that. Totally That's off beautiful. limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So people are allowed to critique but it's not, uh, it's done in a way about the story. Exactly. Okay.